grapple with our past, and also celebrate the incredible culture and history we have with our First Nations. And one minute for Dana. Um, the relationship we have, this country has with First Nations is um, terrible. The Green Party, the Green Government, uh, would, for its part, would enshrine uh, UNDRIP into Canadian law and implement calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Uh, it's also outrageous the fact that the Attorney General of Canada just a few days ago made an application for judicial review and for a stay of the ruling uh, with respect to the compensation for the uh, persons hurt, hurt by the residential school crisis. The, in terms of uh, moving forward with reconciliation, it's essential that uh, the Greens have proposed a Council of Canadian Governments whereby uh, First Nations would join the rest of Canada, uh, including municipalities, to negotiate their way out, uh, to work to negotiate their way out of the Indian Act, away from. Thank you. Okay, I think what we're going to do, we are having questions come in through all three um, pathways. So I'm going to go, it'll be written question, go to the mic, and I'm going to go to Slido here in a second. I just want to remind everybody, in order for us to get as much insight from the candidates you want to hear from, uh, we ask you to name somebody, at least one answer. I've had a couple of questions from all candidates. It would mean we're answering one question over 15 minutes. So if you used Slido and you had it for all candidates, you can go in and edit your question. Please direct it to one person. I have one question so far down here that was, wasn't directed to anybody, so I can't ask it. So if it was in regard to Syria, if you know you wrote that, please let me know who you want it directed to. So with that, I'm gonna go to a question on Slido. It is directed towards uh, Patrick. St. Patrick, a liberal campaign promise in 2015 was to tackle election reform. As you know, the idea was quickly abandoned. Do you have any plans to resurrect it? So, um, <clears throat> as part of, uh, in, in 2015 and 2016, there was consultations that took place across the country on um, focused on finding the right system for electoral reform. And I participated in a meeting that took place at the WASC Center in Vancouver about that. We were able to talk about a lot of the different, the different options that we have, everything from mixed member proportionate to, to rank ballot to, to single transferable vote and the pros and cons of each ones. Um, and at, at the end of it, there was consultations happening across the country. There, we couldn't get an agreement on what would be the right system to put on the ballot for electoral reform. And um, I know a lot of people are really disappointed that we weren't able to do that. And I was really disappointed to see also that in BC we weren't able to, to pass electoral reform to get a different type of voting system in our country. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is we had three options on the ballot and not everybody understood it and we had the lowest p amount that actually voted in favor of that change. Um, I'm, I'm very much in support of looking at ways we can improve our democracy. I was really happy to see that, first, first off, the changes to the Senate, making the Senate an independent body where it's supposed to be a, um, a body of sober second thought rather than a partisan body, I think is a huge step forward. Even if it didn't make passing legislation that easy, uh, we need to have it serve its proper role. Um, in addition to that, over the last four years, we've repealed the Voter Suppression Act, um, also known as the, the Fair Elections Act, which was really having, um, making it that much harder for people to actually go out and vote and to vouch for other people. So I think there's, I, th I think that there's a lot of ways we can continue to look at how to make our democracy better. I'd be very much in support of that, and I've had a number of conversations with other members of parliament that, that share that same sentiment. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm reading what I'm given. So you'll see a trend is appearing in terms of where questions are going. Um, this is directed towards the Liberal candidate. If you are, if you are elected, how willing are you to put pressure on your party to clean up the drinking water in indigenous communities? I'm very motivated to continue redoubling our efforts to do this. Over the last um, four years, we've been able to lift, I think it's 81 
of the boil water advisories across the country. We're on track for by 2021 to have eliminated all of them. Um, in Canada right now, it's in a lot of areas of the country, it's almost like we have a developing country. And I think that's, that's something that's completely unacceptable and we need to do a lot better. And um, I, I work very hard to make sure we continue to make progress in that. And I think it's, it's part of, part of a, a wider issue that we need to deal with on, on reconciliation with First Nations. We need to really continue to rebuild that, nation, that relationship so it is a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. It needs to be founded on respect and trust. And there's a long ways to go the, to actually um, have First Nations reach the standard of living that, that we have as, as settlers. And um, I was talking to the Seashell Nation yesterday about it. They're, they're in the process of doing a study where they can benchmark where, where First Nations are relative to Canada and, and um, use that as a starting point on, on how we can look at reforming wider services like, like health care and, and education to really be able to bring, bring up that standard of living. So that's something I'd, I'd really like to, to be involved in helping make more progress on um, and, uh, and really to help provide the tools for First Nations to also get out from under the Indian Act and get governance of their own affairs. We have new legislation for assessing projects in Canada with the new Impact Assessment Act. And as part of that, there's an ability to, to um, take part of those assessments and have it done specifically by Indigenous governments. So I'd like to work with, with some of the governments in our writing here to capacity build and make sure we can have them have a proper say over projects that will affect them. Thank you. Uh, you may have noticed that, that Terry Grimwood left, stating that this format doesn't work for him. And quite unapologetically, that's not the point. The point is to have this format work for you. Because whoever is elected will be working for you. Okay? And with that, over to Bob. Well, I'm just wondering, could I have a minute and a half from two different candidates? You can ask the question of your first candidate, and no, like we don't want to change the format. I don't want to split it in half. You can come to the mic again. Yeah. Well, so they, they can change. they can get, give it to you no, but she can respond in one with a minute after he oh, has his two. Like sure, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Number one, TMAX pipeline uh, is absolutely that uh, we will not support any government that plans to build and complete the expanse of Trans Mountain. After that, it's also uh, continued. We would expectations to remove subsidies from all fracking, all uh, gas and oil exploration. All uh, any any monies that are going to the, the gas and oil industry, and begin to migrate those dollars, incentivizing other clean in, in technologies that exist today. Um, and Judith has the same opportunity with a one-minute response. I think the first thing, if it was me doing it, because I'm not certain really what. Ultimately, it would be because our party has said that electoral reform would be one of the non-negotiables. But I do think that there are a number of other very serious issues that would have to be on the table. Uh, the issues surrounding climate change, we do need to treat climate change as an emergency. I don't know whether or not, you know, stopping the pipeline would be the top of that list, but it would be in there. I also think that we have to have somewhere in there treating housing as an emergency, because housing is an emergency, and unless we address that, we are going to have s serious ongoing problems. So the emergencies have to be dealt with. Those are my issues. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the candidates for coming. Thank you. All right. All right. Trying to find one direct. Okay, Gabriel, how will you address childcare in our riding, keeping in mind that employers are challenged by housing affordability versus wages? As I mentioned earlier, when it comes to childcare, there's a number of different things that I'd like to propose. 
One would be to put the legislation in place to allow a number of, of businesses to combine to provide daycare for their employees on a tax-free basis. The other thing we have to allow is to allow people to use their homes and uh, open up home-based daycares and allow them to do so without the red tape that comes in with having kids in their home while still maintaining safety. It's something when you look at the legislation right now for childcare operators, which is a provincial matter, by the way, we have childcare ratios of one supervisor to four kids under the age of three. And when you have kids aged three to five, that goes up to eight kids. So I wouldn't want eight kids in my house, but four might be okay. So I think what we have to allow is that, you know, you don't ask the home-based daycare provider to literally renovate their home for thousands of dollars just because you need to have a daycare in your home. We need to make six, six in, we need to make changes to the red tape that allows people to do what has to be done to accommodate the child care needs of this community. It's a special community and it needs to be treated as such. Thank you. Um, and just to remind, we're gonna go written question, Mike Slido. So I'm at a written question at this point. Um, and I wanna shout out to the young people here under 19 who are here at the All Candidates meeting on a building on the issue of kids, childcare, et cetera. Um, I wasn't sure if it was like just really awesome learning or if you'd done something really, really bad at home. I don't know. But, um, but this is absolutely worth asking. It's directed towards Doug Bebb. It is a question from Tindra, who's in our audience. She is 11 years old. Uh, and the question is, why are you not doing anything for climate change? Or do you, Doug, Doug you've got two minutes. Well, the Greens have never told the whole story of global warming. And now <clears throat> they're in denial about several recent scientific and political developments. On the political front, Petri Talas, the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, took the climate alarmist to task on September 6th, calling for cool he cooler heads to prevail and saying that he does not accept arguments of climate alarmists that the end of the world is at hand. This was closely followed by a letter to the United Nations from a high-level glo global network of 500 prominent climate scientists and professionals declaring there is no climate emergency. Important scientific developments are linked on the global warming page on my website at bebb2019ppc.ca. So wherever the, the debate on global warming ends up, these developments make it crystal clear that there is no consensus and that we are not in any sort of an emergency situation. Because there's no need to rush to judgment, the PPC will take the time needed to consider all new evidence as it becomes available. In the meantime, will the Greens abandon their climate hysteria now that science is turning against them, or will they continue to yell fire in classrooms overcrowded with frightened young children simply to advance their political agenda. And I should put with the last 30 seconds, I would like to say that there is consensus around the fact that the planet is warming. It's clear it's been warming for 21,000 years, is up about a degree in 200 years. That's clear, no argument there. The fact that the idea that uh, carbon dioxide is the main driver of climate change is in dispute and very few scientists think that it's an emergency situation, so we have time to consider our options before. All right. Um, we're gonna go to a mic, the microphone, so it's your opportunity there. Hello, and my question is for uh, Bev. And yeah, I've got a couple of bit from Taylor as well. Uh, my question is, what is your opinion on the voices of the youth that are too young to vote in the community? Voices of the youth, like what do you think of the youth opinion? They're like too young to be official voters, to officially need to come out their statements made, but still want to make statements. I, we're all in favor of free speech. We like to hear what young people say. It's tragic, I think, that they're being used 
um, for political purposes. And uh, it's also tragic that the youth of, of today, well, actually, you know, I started off a talk here about, uh, well, after the climate march by suggesting that uh, it's not what we don't know that hurts us, but ultimately what we know for sure that just ain't so. And I think that the, the youth of this country needs to have a sober second look because you will, in fact, bear the burden of decisions we make today, whether we take immediate action or don't. And uh, science is not settled on the basis of consensus. So don't believe the idea that because a majority of people or scientists think one thing that is necessarily true. There's a hundred scientists came out against, uh, oh, let's see, well, um, it's happened several times over the course of history. Uh, Einstein, for example, was refuted by a hundred uh, notable scientists in his day, and it proved to be the mistake. I mean, science has been wrong on, on important issues in the past, and they might well be here, but it should be clear from these documents I've read, or referenced for you, that you can look up online, one is the European Climate Declaration, that there is no consensus at all, and there's a second opinion to be, to be uh, examined, and we have the time to do it, and it's, it's uh, in your best interest to make sure you do that because you don't want to have a, a debt burden in the future you have to pay back because we've taken the wrong action now and then have to adapt later anyways. So the money should be spent on real concrete uh, things like water, oil, uh, air, water, air, and soil, and not toxic stuff. And Dana, you've got a minute. Uh, uh, this is uh, from a gentleman whose leader uh, has to pick on a 16-year-old girl and call her mentally unstable. Uh, the scientists he refers to, I think, all graduated from Trump University, paid for by the Koch brothers. <laughs> the, uh, the reality is, uh, to, to respect your opinion on this, is that the Green Party, were it to form government, 16-year-olds would have a vote. Greta Thunberg could speak for herself before, uh, at, during election. Uh, we certainly support youth. We'll continue to support youth and their opinion. I was here during the uh, march of the march in Worcester. I attended the rally in Squamish. I support youth on this issue because I believe that youth are capable of, first of all, informing themselves, seeking out the information they require, and then making their own decisions. So that's my position. Okay. I'll go to Slido. Um, this is going to be for Dana and Gabrielle. We'll have a minute after Dana. Whistler Mountain is sacred land for the local Indigenous people. What would you do to help integrate Indigenous people into the larger Sea to Sky community? Um. This is something that, first of all, I, I have to back up well, to answer this question. My personal belief is, and I've come to know this, I, I admit, only in fairly recent years. Um, our relationship with Indigenous people in this country has failed all of us. Uh, in the information that I've, I, I've, I've gathered myself in recent years tells me we've got a lot of repeal, uh, fixing to do. I began part of the conversation with the Squamish Band and members of the Squamish Nation in, uh, on this when they were looking at heritage and how to preserve the heritage of that city and that town. I believe perhaps a similar model might work here. In order for there to be presence of, uh, for we, the settler population, in an area such as Whistler, the, the integration has to take place by respecting the views of both participants and perhaps beginning to interpret the history of both participants uh, right from the beginning and, and ensuring that that interpretation is known and forms part of our joint history doesn't exist in two separate count, in two separate counts camps uh, and that then it, and then becomes part of the broader discovery of what this place is about 
I don't. I, I think that it's a, it, it becomes something that is it happens at both a um, higher level within government. It must occur there, but this community, I think, has the capacity and ability to work with Little Watt Nation and and uh, and Squamish to to bring that information forward uh, to work with the emerging Worcester community that I'm sure uh, most of which are all newcomers to this area. All right, and over to Gabrielle. In order to make any true, true full reconciliation between all the bands and any particular town, we need to have a cooperation and a discussion on how and what is needed to make that happen. We need economic resources for the various Indigenous bands, and that was proven even more so today when four bands got together and signed a memorandum of, op of understanding to export LNG to countries that are right now using coal in an effort to reduce greenhouse gases. They were doing it because they need the economic benefit. There can be no true reconciliation without economic re reconciliation at the same time. People need roofs over their head they need clean water to drink, and they need to be able to get ahead. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the mic in just a second. I'm going to make an executive exception because uh, this is a this is very interesting to give us a chance to hear from everybody. And we're going to start at the end with you, Doug, and we'll just come along um, in three words or less. So you each get three words or less. Describe what qualifies you uniquely to work on behalf of Whistler. Good problem solver. In, integrity, compa uh, integrity, conviction, and honesty. Results, action, accountability. Can I borrow another word? Integrity, passion, and experience. Thoughtful, compassionate, dedicated. Tenacious. Tenacious. Okay. Tenacious. Um, all right. Now we're going to go to the microphone. I didn't come with a prepared answer to that question, um, and it's one that actually is a very close to home question for me as well, living on the Sunshine Coast. Um, where do you go if, you know, things start going up? And there were a couple times in the last couple of years when there were little fires. In fact, this past summer, there was one uh, a little fire started just up at, you know, eight kilometers from my house. I think really... Trying to address climate change is a big thing as, as part of the long-term future for trying to reduce the, the, the risk factors. But we have to think about, like right now, mitigate. What, how can we deal with this? And I think the only thing that I could say is I would work with the provincial government who has the mandate for providing, you know, providing support and see what the federal government could do and to reach into its pockets to find some of the funding that is needed to do the work in the forest that reduces the actual risks. And I'm not a forester, so I, I can't, you know, give you the actual, uh, what are the things that you do, but from what I understand that there's brush control measures that can be taken. There are things that you can do around your community in terms of making sure that the structures that you build and the um, area around them are 
uh, basically done in such a way that you are not creating basically tinder piles right around your house. Uh, there, are, there, is, there are things that we can do to reduce some of the risks, but the risk of a major fire coming down isn't going to be solved by worrying about whether or not you have a cedar deck or a uh, non-flammable deck. So I think the big issue is going to have to be basically work on climate change, and that means working with all of us because the truth is this isn't, this isn't something that oh, is a issue. Okay. No, that, we're at time on that one. Uh, thank you, though. Um, let's see. Gabrielle, what is the reasoning for universal tax cuts specifically for those in the top income brackets? And if you can fit it in two minutes for good form, you're also being asked, when can we expect the Conservative Party's platform? I'll do, so, the, I'll do the first go one. Go with first. universal tax cuts. Yeah, what is the reasoning for universal tax cuts specifically for those in the top income brackets? Okay, so the, the answer on the second part, the full platform is apparently being released by next week. Uh, but on the universal tax cut, it actually saves the average Canadian over $850 a year. And it's meant to promote more tax, more money in your pocket if you are lower income. So it actually has a benefit to low income as opposed to high income. The amount that we're looking at is to ensure that there's more money in your pocket. If you look at Economics 101, if people have more money in their pocket, they have more money to spend. They spend that money on services and goods in their own community, even abroad. They are able to then spend more money, put money into the hands of small business owners who then pay tax, expand their businesses, hire more people. It's a circle that actually works to ensure that we can all get ahead. And it's not the high income earners with the universal tax cut that it'll affect, it's actually the low income earners. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going to a written question. This is directed towards uh, Doug and Gordon. We'll have a minute to respond, rebut, or just provide your opinion. This question asks, uh, what is your opinion or thoughts on LGBTQ plus rights? Well, we in the People's Party think that everybody should be, be treated the same. We have four watchwords that are individual responsibility, personal freedom, fairness, and respect. And everybody should be respected. All of our policies have to pass these four tests, and they also have to be internally consistent. Um, other parties want to make race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and other small group identity characteristics the key focus of policy and ultimately of Canadian life. This approach is divisive. The People's Party is the only party to say these things don't matter to us. Treat everyone with respect and treat them all the same. And uh, that's what we're going to do. Equal rights for all means special rights for none. Okay, thank you. I can't offer much more than that. I believe in treating everybody equally as well. So I, I like to think that we're, uh, we're all of similar mind on this particular question. So I hope to get uh, uh, a question that I can provide uh, a little bit more on at some point. All right. That, uh, it's, it's, it's in the wings. There's stuff here. Uh, but I'm going to go to the microphone. Oh, oh she, sorry, whoever's, uh, whoever's uh, there in line.
When I decided to run, I looked at all the different parties of which one I would want to go for. I ran in the municipal election, and my girlfriend phoned me up on the Monday after the election when I didn't win and said, I'm so glad you didn't win. And I, my first reaction was, thanks. She said, no, I think you would do so much better at the federal level. Being a tax accountant, small business owner, you understand all the things that we have on a daily basis. When I looked at the Conservative Party, one of the things that I liked was the fact that their fiscal policy aligned with my fiscal policy. And the first question I had was, so what, am I gonna, what are you going to do to me if I don't have the same social ideas as you? I'm a social liberal and a fiscal conservative. Does that mean you're going to kick me out? And I met with party representatives, and they assured me that one of the things the Conservative Party allows is members of their caucus, members of their parliament, to actually have their own ideas, their own views, and their own decisions. The fact that I can say, you know what, I think there is climate change. I am all in favor of LGBTQ rights, and I am pro-choice, is something that I love. I love to be able to stand there because I think our parliamentary system is there to have the best representative of your constituency of this riding go to Ottawa and actually represent you and not be whipped by their party. What's the worst they can do to me? Kick me out. I think that's what I have to do is actually voice the opinion of the riding. It's not always my choice. It's the riding, and I think that's where we have to get to with all members of Parliament, and the person who is the leader is the one who has most people in Ottawa. We have to stop voting for our Prime Minister and start voting for ourselves. Okay. Uh, this next question is for Patrick uh, and then Dana. The National Energy Board environmental assessment process is seriously flawed. What steps would you take to fix and ensure that nature is properly valued and protected? So as someone who's worked within the HARPA era environmental laws, I completely agree with, with, this, with the statement. Um, working within those laws and the frustration of, of um, working specifically in the National Energy Board reviews for interveners, for the city of Burnaby, for the Squamish Nation, the, the whole process treated consultation with First Nations as a box checking exercise. It really ignored any viewpoints that were different from the proponent, and it really ran roughshod over any evidence that contradicted what was submitted by the applicant. So that was an incredibly frustrating process to go through, and it's one of the main reasons that I'm running for the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party brought in a new environmental assessment, uh, a whole host of new environmental legislation at the end of June, right at the end of the, the parliamentary session. There was significant opposition in the Senate from the Conservative senators who are being heavily pressured from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers not to go ahead with those changes. And the fact that the Liberal Party stood firm and did not gut the legislation as they were trying to have really convinced me that the Liberal Party was serious about conserving the environment and have a robust way of assessing projects so that we're not going to endanger any sensitive areas. Um, and for me, that was the catalyst that made me decide to run for the Liberal Party because we need to have trust in the way the, the way that our, our projects are being assessed to make sure that we're going to protect um, the areas that we all value. One of the things that um, this new legislation brings in is properly assessing how it's going to affect us meeting our climate change goals, um, what, what that's going to be to our contribution to sustainability. But what I'd like to see going forward and something I helped to, well, help to work on is looking at strategic environmental assessments and cumulative effects assessments and looking at things at a higher level rather than just projects. Thank you. You have excellent timing, I must tell you. He dials it down to zero. I'm watching the timer. It's crazy. Dana. Uh, likewise, similar concerns that Nash, the National Energy Board, uh, particularly with respect to their approvals of Trans Mountain and Wood Fiber. Uh, working with the local groups uh, on all of these issues, my seat is Sky and Mead now, discovered that the reference, previously referenced consultation process uh, is one of the 
main issues with it, but so is the regulatory aspect of it. It's clear that, that uh, changes have to be made that actually support uh, and, and permit public, in, public input to the extent that all matters before are being considered. And, 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 then, uh, uh, and then enforced. What we have, what we're actually faced with currently with the case of both Wood Fibre and Trans Mountain is approvals that took place under a flaw, uh, that were flaw, under a flawed process uh, and no willingness to step back from it. The current, the, the Liberal government, outgoing Liberal government um, for their. Thank you. Sorry, you hit, you hit time. Um, we're gonna keep her coming. This question is for Gordon. What will you do for climate change? Um, I've said in, in, in previous events, uh, the, the debate over climate change is a waste of time. What's the worst we can do? Clean up the environment in which we live, you know? Uh, no one wants to live in a cesspool. No one wants to breathe in smog. We need to, we need to clean things up. We need to get started on this yesterday, not today. Uh, I'm I think I'm the only candidate who does not drive, whether it be a lithium-ion battery-based car or, or a fossil fuel-based car. Uh, I personally have been using all scrap paper for my uh, campaign. Um, so, well, if I'm elected, I'll probably be the only representative of my party. My uh, abilities will, to enact change will not be great, but uh, I will represent your interests as best I can. And I know that you're very concerned about the environment, so I am absolutely in favor of cleaning up the environment. Um, it's recently come to my attention that uh, a lot of our recycling ends up shipped overseas to be incinerated. I want a massive recycling overhaul. Um, I think single-use plastics should have been banned. They've been an issue for more than just uh, now in an election year. They should have been they, uh, banned when the Liberals got uh, into power four years ago, if they were serious about it. I think the onus needs to shift from, companies, uh, from, from customers to companies when it com uh, comes to packaging. We need to uh, uh, ban that stuff altogether, and that'll drive uh, innovation, and which will make uh, eco-friendly packaging cheaper. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We're going to go to Mr. Zantri. Thirty seconds, Rob. No, I know you. Thirty seconds. I got, I got, when does it start? So now? Is it already now. I stand before you as a gutted voter, as a 48-year-old man who's been to numerous elections. I've been lied to my entire life by most of the parties. I 100% agree with what you said, Gordon, from the standpoint of I stand. I, I got to guide my children how to vote, and I'm like, who screwed you the least is how you vote? And how disgusting is it that I say that? My question is this: for Doug and for Gordon. The other four parties, I've listened to it my entire life, lies, they get touted, accountability, responsibility, acceptability, and responsibility. And those things, after an office, leave the door. They just literally are lies and they fall on the carpet. And it just turns my stomach. Question. What are you going to do to change my mind? And help me guide my family and my children. And my Who's family. that for? You need, you can pick. Gordon okay. Gordon and, Gordon and Doug, got it. Doug first, Gordon second. Okay, there you go, Doug. Well, the reason that I joined the uh, People's Party of Canada after a big hiatus from politics, I, j I became a politician in April, is because I share the same view of politics. Uh, I, I think we need some more integrity put back into the process. Um, the accountability, accountability issue is one that uh, we could possibly address through an expanded, and Maxime has promised an expanded uh, program of private members' bills to bring uh, bills on behalf of the constituents of, of Sea to Sky. Um, I've got recommendations from some supporters that we have uh, uh, either yearly or now I understand even uh, four times a yearly uh, update uh, of what has been achieved as compared to what was promised, uh, and I've undertaken to do that, to provide those sorts of updates. And uh, frankly, if things change and I see that things aren't going the way I want from the standard of integrity, I won't be a party member anymore. But for now, uh, we have a straightforward, honest message. Maxime is a straight guy, and 
I like all the policies. They're all out there for people to examine on the website. And it's a matter of personal integrity for me. And that's all I have to say. Great. Thank you. Um, apathy and disenfranchisement uh, really plague our generation. And it's, it's really hard to blame anyone. Um, people tend to, yeah, uh, vote for the lesser of two evils. And I, I keep saying, don't. <laughs> Choose good. Don't just vote for the best liar. Um, I'm beholden to none. I've been using my own finances uh, to get to, to manage my campaign. This is my full-time job, and it's, it's been running me ragged. I'm getting sick. I'm very tired. Um, but it's given me a sense of purpose. I feel like my purpose in life is to help restore your faith in our democracy. I think it's very important. Um, so yeah, I, will ex I have accepted no campaign donations uh, from, from any companies. Um, Many of the other people at this table's parties cannot say the same. I'm beholden to none, and I would accept none without seriously vetting those companies. And I'm also the only candidate who's committed to pledging 10 Okay. Okay. No, don't make me drum, man. Don't make me drum. Let's just roll. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, this one is directed just at Judith. Judith, what plans do you have to help BC small business scale into larger and more sustainable enterprises that will employ, employ more BCers and increase provincial GDP? Well, the New Democratic Party uh, has been accused by some of having two ambitious spending pro programs. Among them are massive amounts of investment in housing. We're going to need to involve small business in that enterprise in order for that huge construction industry. We're also going to need it with the climate change energy program. We're talking about 300,000 jobs in that sector. Some of them need to come to Whistler. Whether we're talking about changes that are needed in our transit systems, whether we're talking about manufacture of a whole lot more uh, electric cars and the infrastructure that goes with it, these are things that are going to be very large in the green economy that's going to replace the oil and gas economy that we have now. And these are going to come. I am actually very happy to say that nobody has a monopoly on green policies. I am happy to hear that the Liberal Party is actually talking about doing some of the things that they haven't done for the last four years. I'm really happy that the Green Party has been working diligently to make sure these issues get in front of the public. What I will say, though, is that you can't be just for green policies. You have to be for social policies as well, because they go hand in hand. So for me, it's building healthy economies, healthy communities, and making sure that when we have a member of parliament in Ottawa, that we go and we get our fair share of the dollars that are out there for our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've got a written question for Patrick Weiler. In 2018, Kinder Morgan bailed on the pipeline expansion project because they considered it too much of a financial risk to their shareholders. The Alberta government is now fighting against the federal carbon tax in court. Many people in BC, including many in this riding, felt like they were slapped in the face when Mr. Trudeau's government purchased the pipeline with our taxpayers' money. Given this situation and the declaration of a climate emergency by the federal government, do you still support spending another nine to 12 billion of our taxpayers' money on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project? I, th I, think, I, th I think when we're thinking about the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, we need, we need to think of it in the context of everything that happened when it was approved. So the same day that the, the pipeline was approved, the Northern Gateway was, was cancelled. Um, we brought, this led to bringing in a national climate change strategy, which included Alberta accepting to have a national price on carbon and having a, a, a 100 ton, 100, sorry, 100 megaton limit on the emissions from the, the oil sands. So I think, I think we need to think of it in the context of that. The, um, the pipeline, I mean, we're gonna be transporting oil by, by pipeline, by rail, or by truck. Pipeline is the safest of the three ways to transporting it. 
And this is seen for the Alberta economy as a key way of, of reducing the price differential for oil. Um, <clears throat> The, the focus for the pipeline is to use the revenues that's generated from it, which is expected to be up to $500 million in corporate tax revenues per year to directly fund the transition to the clean energy economy that we're working towards. And that's what we need to do. We need to have a viable plan to transition. Um, and it's, gonna, it's a $2.5 trillion annual economy. And it's something that we need to get those jobs here in Canada. That's why we're cutting corporate taxes in half for companies that are working in this sector, um, because we already have amazing research institutions that are, that are putting out companies like Carbon Engineering, which are capturing and sequestering carbon from the atmosphere, and we need to have a lot more programs like that. Um, 